every experienced wood turner I know has a story. A story of a nemesis, nemesis tree. A piece of vegetation that hates you so much for cutting it down that it wants to send you straight to hell. This is my nemesis tree. I mean, there were so many barbed wire, spikes, bullets, nails. When I was sectioning up, I probably went through 20 chainsaw blades cutting up bulb lengths. I hated it from the get-go. And then, when I started processing the trees, more bullets, more bugs, stuff like that. So much so that I kind of set a bunch of the bulb lengths to the side. I just didn't enjoy them. And those eventually ended up in my slacker stack. Well, about six months ago, I decided I would give it a go again. I ventured out and I pulled out this blank right here. This piece of pecan crete. For those of y'all that don't know, that's pecan that has dried out. Because it becomes as hard as concrete when it does. Well, I learned a lesson then. You never want to core pecan crete. You, you can core pecan when it's green, but pecan crete, you don't want to touch it. I have never had a catch so violent in my life. And I was coring something. I was scraping. It, it's not a situation where you normally get a catch. But this thing was, you know, it's a good 45 pounds right now, fully dry. Spinning at about five, 600 RPMs. I had this giant bar hollowing out. Shavings were coming out somewhat dusty. But then, that 45 pound, 500 RPM hunk of the concrete stopped. And it stopped instantly. And if you understand physics, that force of 45 pounds spinning at 500 RPMs doesn't just stop. It didn't come out of the chuck. It transferred all that power into the lake. I quite literally thought the lathe was going to spin around the bulb light. How the arm on my, my hollowing thing just didn't snap in half, I have no idea. The concrete literally cracked. There are cracks in the concrete. I turned the lathe off. I backed away. That, this blank stayed in the chunk for a good two weeks. Didn't go back to the lathe. It hates me. But today, I'm going to see if I can exact a little bit of revenge out there. We ain't hollowing this thing out. I'm just going to cut it out. Though, I'm about two-thirds of the way through, so I don't know what's going to happen. But we're going to try. And it's dry enough now, probably a year later, I should be able to turn it to its final shape off the get-go. So, come along as me. Because I bat battle with my arch nemesis. So welcome to the commentary edition of my turning for concrete video. This video I kind of just wanted to walk through all the steps I do in a video. Yes, I cut it down, but you pretty much see every shaving gun comes out of it and the different techniques I do. Starting from truing the first tin and up which I you do it between a drive spur and the live center. And when I first did the video, when, in my mind, I thought I would show you all the process I use for sharpening. I swap out my platform. I have one set to 40 degrees. I have another one set to 70 for my skew. And I just use different platforms for different tools. My bowl gouge and my scrapers, I do this 40 degree platform. And I wanted to take the time to show you my process for sharpening my gouge because when I do it for the first time on a project, I take the time to really dial it in. But about, a, uh, about 20 minutes into the video, I realized how hard this project was and how much I was sharpening. So in the start, I'll tell you when I go back to the lathe and then at, to the grinder. And after that, I started recording little snippets of me going to the grinder 
so the audience can see how often you sharpen. So here I'm turning on the bowl gouge, stepping far away from it as I turn it up to speed because it is a heavy, big bowl. And then you just true up the tenon. And on this tenon, it's not a straight tenon. It is slightly dovetailed if you watch what I do here. So I cut my tenon. I clear out the back of it, which I should do a better job, which you'll see later on what, what I'm talking about. But then I clear out the face. That's the key important part, right? That cut right there. It has to be consistent all the way around because that's what the jaws must rest against. Any space between that and the jaws will cause a vibration. And this thing is just too heavy. Right there, I'm willing to bet that is a time that that bowl bought, like, cracked on me. Right here, just take off the drive spur, rechuck it up. And now notice, I cannot seat it. There's too much meat on that tenon, so... This is something I end up doing quite a bit just because I'm not a very good judge of space and I don't measure anything. So quick quick work with the chisel. That took about 30, 45 seconds, no big deal. And then now it will fully seat. But it was so heavy, I couldn't tighten up the jaws before it came off a little bit. So that's why the tailstock came up and I focus on getting it all the way even. Watch this next shot. See, there's no gap in between that leg and the chuck and the bolt. And here I start basically just removing away all the wobble. You gotta get it running true before you can see what you've actually got. There might be something hidden in there. So I will typically clean the face up. I'm using a pull cut right there. It's the quickest way I know to remove a lot of material. And then I'll do the same for the side. And because uh, I didn't do this when it was in the drive spur, I'm going to do a pull cut for about half of it just to get rid of a lot of the wobble. And if you look at the side, you can see the shadow that's there. Whenever it's running solid, you don't see that shadow, that highlight. And right now I push to a push cut. The pull cut works off of the wing, the push cut works off the tip. And it was getting dull right here, you can see I'm getting shaving. That right there is also a trick I use to determine if there's any flat spots, which means I don't have it running through yet. Notice right now all the dust that's coming off, that tool is dull. Right here, I went and sharpened it before I went to the next step. And then, just matter of clearing out the interior with a bunch of push cuts. And about every three pushes, I would go back and sharpen. Right before I started this cut right here, I sharpened it. Look at the shavings coming off. Nice, smooth ribbons. On the next cut coming in, uh, I had sharpened it right before that one. So that's why you're getting ribbons. But you can see towards the end, those ribbons start turning dustier. It's getting duller. See, now there's long ribbons there. And you're seeing a lot more dust. So that tool right there, because I switched to the other side of the blade, now it's cutting a little bit sharp. And I'm not cutting as much material into end grain there, but it does get dull. But you work the wings, both sides, and then you kind of even it up in, with the nose. And then every three or four times I'll go to the really coarse wheel, and all I'm doing right there is removing the heel to make it easier to turn uh, corners. Just low use. That's all you do, draw low use. So when you're turning a bowl this size, what I typically do is I'll remove all the meat for three to four inches, and then I'll work on the, on the shapes of the outside of the bowl. If you get the bowl too thin, Watch, watch it coming up right right about here. You can actually see it go dull. I seem to remember this in filming. Right? See it's starting to chatter. I'm getting a lot of dust. Time to go sharpen. And look at how easier it is to cut after that tip is a little bit sharper. Look at this. Like butter for about 10 seconds. Anyways, heading back. You don't want to remove all the meat in the center because that's what stabilizes the bowl. As the bowl gets thinner, 
because wood is not a homogeneous material, it will kind of wobble on you. So you can't get smooth cuts. And that's a lot of times the reason why you get a little bit of tear out or catches on the outside of the bowl. Also, a little trick, I don't like removing that center section. I'll just whack it off with a chisel. Now watch how I'm putting this together. I'm tightening up that quill thing and then progressing it into the wood. If you don't do it that way, a lot of times it won't hit the dead center of what's turning with and it'll put undue pressure on it, which makes it harder to work. This was just to show you all the body position I used. So now that I've removed about half the material of the depth of the bowl, I'm going to start working on the outside looking for cracks. I saw a couple cracks there, so the only objective that I have right now is to remove the material to remove those cracks. So I'm doing a straight cut. I'm not worrying about shape at the moment. I'm just getting rid of the cracks. This is a push cut. So you can see the finish off the cut, but I didn't quite get those cracks going, but I noticed they weren't going very deep. So instead of cutting out the bowl, thinner, I cut it a little bit shorter. Just kind of varies to for, for the situation which way you go there. Nice, simple push cut. Go about a quarter of an inch past where you see the crack and you can generally get rid of it. But you want to check before you do anything else. Watch here. I'm going down here. I'm cutting end to end grain. Watch how fast that tool go. Boom. It stopped cutting. So I switched over to a pull cut to remove the other, use the other side, but it was kind of dull. So button cutting very smooth. You could tell by all the dust. Which means yet another trip back to the grinder. Wings. I slightly round the wings. That's a personal preference and then progress into the tip. You don't want to spend too much time on the tip because there's not as much metal there. So you, you remove it really quickly. It takes longer to remove the metal from the wings. Now here I was, it was a good shot to show you that I do not watch the tool. I watch the edge of the bowl to see, see the shape. It's a lot easier. And if you feel it, you can generally feel the variation better than you can see it. I needed to remove a lot of material here to get the shape I wanted, so yes, I'm going downhill, uphill, but I find the push cuts easier to judge shape. And then I come back with a sheer scraping cut to just clean it up. And that's what I'm doing right now. But once again, back to the grinder. A lot of times to get the perfect shape, you have to actually take it off the lathe, leave it in the chuck, and then set it up right. But notice right now that with a sheer scraping cut, look at the kind of shavings I'm getting. They're tiny little curly cues. That is a cutting action. That is not a scraping action. Following a sheer scrape kind of, it doesn't really justify the cut. It is a cut, not necessarily a scrape. And there's the finish you end up with on it. Minor tear out, easy to get rid of with some higher grit sandpaper. So from there, get rid of the tailstock, remove that live center, because otherwise you will get little tiny nicks on your elbow. You can always tell a turner because of all the scabs on the right elbow. That's from hitting the live center. And notice how deep I am into that bowl. I'm still only about halfway to the bottom. You can see it by the, the distance to the chuck. So now here's where I start working on the rim. Notice I'm only going to go about two to three inches down. Then I'm going to get the perfect shape and the perfect finish off the edge for that space. I am a big fan of graduated curves. It's kind of a style I've been developing this past few years. What I mean to it is when you start the bowl, it's a very low curve and then it gets steeper and steeper and steeper as it goes in. Well, what that allows me to do is have a rim of a bowl that appears to be, you know, three quarters to an inch thick, 
but it almost instantly plunges down to only being a quarter of an inch thick. And it makes a bow deceptively thin. Oh, right here, about the third time I overheated the motor. So I just dropped down the gear so it wouldn't work as hard, but it also couldn't go as fast. Well, on the outside of the bowl, I've got the shape I want. So on the rim, I'm going to do the same thing. It starts a light curve, and then it kind of dives in quite a bit. And then on the underside, I'm going to inverse that, where it's going to start fairly steep curve, and then smooth out to the edge. And that gives your thumbs a really cool resting spot. So that even though the bowl is really light, when you're carrying it around with a, you know, maybe it's full of pasta and meatballs, something heavy, you have a sure grip of it on it, even though it's so smooth. It's that graduated curve. So I got the shape just the way I wanted it. And then I progressed to removing a little bit more material so that I could go farther and deeper into the bowl. And I'm not going to come back to that top section with the exception of maybe the lightest of scrapes just to just to reduce my sanding. So that's what I'm doing right now. Is I'm moving about an inch more thickness so that I can go that much farther on the edge of the bowl. And it's one of those things you do three or four cuts, you go sharpen. Three or four cuts, you go sharpen. So here I'm working on the next two to three inches. You can see you pick up your last final cut. This isn't my final, my finished cut. You can see a line. So I'm picking that up. I just sharpened it. So that's the best my gouge is going to be. And all I'm doing is focusing on that edge thickness. If you watch the shadows, you can see I'm bobbing my head from the outside to the inside. To kind of judge thickness. I'm also not watching my tool. I'm watching the other side of the bowl. So that's always clear. This is something I do. I'm not sure I would recommend it. You notice that the handle is going towards my body. I'm actually doing a pull cut. So I'm using the wing on the inside of the bowl, starting from the inside out, which is going with the grain. But I wouldn't always recommend it. And I, this is also where I pulled out my negative rake scraper because I'm getting to the point where I'm finishing four to five inches on the inside so I want to go ahead and get the final finish cut on those to avoid any sanding. And you notice in a second I let a little vibration you heard so I put my finger on the outside to push in on it because it's actually about a quarter of an inch right there. That's where that wobble is coming from to brace it so I don't have to take that sanding marks out. Downside of those interior uh, the lip coming in is it just holds the shavings. So from here on out, it's working about two, maybe three inches at a time, finishing in it, and then removing material on the bottom and working the rest. You're also going to notice in a second, I'm going to pull out another scraper. It's a regular scraper that I put a heavy hook on for the simple reason, in order to ride the bevel on the bowl gouge, I was getting to the point where I was hanging a good five or six inches off of the tool rest. I just don't have the right kind of uh, tool rest to get in close. So it w I wasn't in as, as control as I like. So I switched to the scraper on the very bottom just because my tool rest wasn't big enough to use a bowl gouge. So right there, I'm using my fingers to look for any highlights. And that's that normal scraper. Look at how my arm is bouncing. Look at the size of the shavings, the thickness, the rate that they are falling with their mass to give you an idea. I sharpen the heavy hook on the coarser grit and notice the platform is a little bit lower. And right here you can see the impact. And it's one of the signs you take a couple passes, go to the grinder. Take a couple passes, go to the grinder. Now, I, I know a lot of y'all out there are saying, well, Sean, you should just use carbide. I guarantee I probably would have gone through all four sides of at least a couple carbide bits doing this kind of material. The con is just that hard. But the advantage of having it that dense and that hard is 
you get such a nice finish off the blade. You don't have to do that much sanding. And I hope you notice that the difference, my arm's not bouncing with this negative rake scraper, but it also does not do very much work. That is really just a finish pass. It will take off like a half a millimeter of uh, material over a couple passes if you have a little hump that you can feel but not see. And that's what I'm doing right now. I'm just getting it cosmetically good to the fingers and the eyes. And then the most boring part, sanding. I did reveal a couple cracks on the outside. So a trick is to put a little sanding sealer, which is shellac, right around it, and then drizzle some thin CA. The shellac means that the CA is not going to bond with the outside. It's just going to soak in. Then that paper towel, I just kind of spread it out and drive it in. It kind of cures it a little bit quicker because it's cotton. And then you sand it, and you won't see the CA glue. If I didn't put that shellac in there, there would be a little dark patch where the CA was. Anywhere the CA touched. So now uh, I need to do the base and I use some aluminum jumbo jaws. They have these rubber feet on it and I found that the older they, uh, those rubber feet are, the more they leave little black marks, especially on something really big that I might not have fully extended out for fear of cracking and they might have skidded a little bit. The blue tape just prevents the black marks. So when I do a base on my upper end ones, I will make it completely round and then I will cut in the foot where I want it. That's generally a feature of how deep I went with the bowl and the shape. This one right here, I wanted the foot to be about a quarter of the diameter because I thought that would look right. It would sit right. And that the sides of the bowls are really, really thin, but in that same graduated remark, the way they curve on the outside, the bottom is probably three quarters of an inch. So there's a bottom weight bias with that bowl that I, I think it has a cool feel to it. And I will leave that tailstock on as long as possible because on a deep bowl like this, you are fairly far away from the chuck. So there is a lot of torque that will pull that piece out of the work if you're not careful. But there you go. Off the blade. I did find another crack. So I rough stuffed it up with some rough coarse sandpaper and I drove that sawdust into the crack. A little bit of shellac, CA glue, and then sand it. Because this crack was a little bit bigger, it, it will show in the final product, but I don't think it's that big a deal. You can see that's the worst it looks right there. And on the outside, because of the shape, I can pull out my little drill sander. And there you go. We are done turning. And you can see the shine off of it with no finish whatsoever. And right here is a shot everybody... I try to show the undercut with my finger there because it just doesn't show in the pictures. But it's a really cool undercut. I'm proud of that design. Something I've been kind of working on these past few years. And look at the color of pecan with oil. I'm using a little walnut oil from Mahoney's right here. And I will put one coat of oil on it every day for a few days. Technically, you're supposed to do a coat every day for a week, then a coat every week for a month, and then a coat every month for a year, and then as needed to get a really perfect finish on it. But most of the time, I just do two or three coats, and I say, it's ready to sell. Isn't that pretty? Gotta like pecan. Well, I hope you enjoyed the commentary. This is just me sitting through, talking about it. One take as I went through. He did my janky little panning shots because I don't have a, those rails. This is just freehand. But it shows you all the elements of the bowl. Y'all be safe and have fun.